Good evening and welcome to this episode of oh. Beer Ladies Podcast. And um, with me this evening is Lisa, Christina Hello. and Katie. Hello. Say hi guys. And we guys. are here to talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're here to, we're going to go talk about the history of Christmas beers this year, this week even. Um, so first up, we will start with what are we drinking? Christina, do you want to? So, so, to, so today was a raid the back of my beer cabinet kind of a day. Um, and I have been hoarding this bad boy for years. Oh um, this is uh, this is Boulevard Brewing Company, um, which is in Kansas City, Missouri. And I brought this over um, from America one time one of my trips to america i brought this back and this is the limited edition release ale stays on brett um smokestack series and this is from 2016 so i have been hoarding this for quite the quite a while um on the back it says a traditional belgian style saison um then the fun began it was dry hopped fo- followed by bottle conditioning um with in- uh, with various yeast including bretomyces um farmhouse i received three months in bottle age prior to release further cellaring will continue to enhance the brett character if that's what you're after so i have (laughs) cellared this um for four years wow uh totally intentional i mean that's exactly what i planned the whole time um so i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna be drinking this today very nice how about you katie I am drinking a Larkin's, not my gumdrop buttons, gingerbread brown ale. I want to try that one. And it is, uh, so Larkin's are Wicklow. Yeah, and it is 6.5%. I don't really know what to expect with a gingerbread brown (laughs) ale. I don't think I've ever had one before. Yeah. Um, And uh, it smells really gingery. It's a lovely gingery smell. (laughs) Oh, interesting. Well, and yeah. I have the yellow belly red noir. So oh, nice. although I've been going through my, my beer advent calendar, I, I just thought, oh, I'll pull out something that looks sort of malty and interesting. And uh, I know we say dark red ale, so 4.5%. Uh, you know, always like everything from yellow belly, but I, I will uh, hold it up. Uh, and so Ooh. I'll show you guys the glass. So I know you guys who are just listening can't see the glass, but I think we'll all agree that maybe dark red and brown mm-hmm. might be the same thing so that's very dark yeah, very yeah, yeah, yeah. very dark red <laughs> yes yes it is and I, I like it a lot but I you know I feel like maybe the maybe the border between those is not a real one yeah, and that's yeah. okay so <laughs> bit of a fuzzy border that's okay. exactly so Lisa- I oh sorry another one Are no you? Lisa I was just gonna say it looks like you're about to jump to hyperspace like you look like <laughs> yeah you're, uh, oh, yeah, it does actually. Like, uh, you look yeah, like you're in are, like a they spaceship. are christmas lights um and in fact uh there's there's a picture of gritty in the back in the middle of the lights uh, but i only see him if i move the chair unfortunately oh. so but but yes for those who can't see this if you just google gritty christmas lights you can get some really good zoom backgrounds <laughs> highly recommend so <laughs> then joanne's t-shirt you could just say make it so yes and it would happen make, make she would go to hyper make, make it, it snow. snow yeah yes, yes. and I, I do also have a, a festive christmas Ooh, nice. for, uh, sweatshirt uh for the wedding present the band has put out this year a series of christmas jumpers uh and i also got one of their uh themed masks too because it's 2020 you have to get a mask so i, I also have a george best mask as Befits oh. this year, I guess. So oh. there you go. Festive spirit. Yeah. So I have a uh, Sammy Get. I get this. Ah, every, you oh, I'm for it. Yeah, yeah. So I get I get a few of these every year around Christmas. So it's kind of a bit of a tradition, but it's um it's Austrian, isn't it? And they, they brew it once a year on December sixth, and it's aged for ten months before bottling. Yes, yeah, so, so it's, it's Austrian now. It wasn't always. It was a yeah. Swiss, but we'll yeah. talk about it. Yeah, mm. it's a it's a double box style, I think, isn't it? Yeah, and it is very yeah. strong. Yeah, it, yes, it is. It comes in at um fourteen percent. So we'll we'll drink it slowly. Yes, yeah, but, definitely um, a sipper. But it's lovely. It's it just it reminds me of Christmas pudding. Yeah, and it just tastes like Christmas. So why not? Definitely, and it's definitely not the beer to have after you've been to a Christmas party, when you're trying to wait for the train home, uh, just if, just saying, 
don't from experience don't be that person <laughs> i'm just saying i feel like there's a story there somewhere that needs to be told i wish i could remember more of the story but <laughs> I, I will say the, the part in the train station, I, I was not feeling great, but it tasted oh, good. Yes. So, mm. <laughs> but yeah, sipping all good, uh, mm. but don't, don't have it as your, I'm, I'm not good. I'm not great. As sipping, just so one more beer of the night. Mm. <laughs> Sometime in the next century, when my phone dies down on my beer, I'll let you know how it tastes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it was, oh, oh, wow. Nice. Ooh. Wow. Nice. That is quite a head. So that's, that's, it's probably the, it must be the beer's fault though I presume. It's no, yeah, it's fault. not it's it's not me. <laughs> no. I do know how to pour a beer. <laughs> well, it's been in there. It's been waiting to come mm. out and now it's like Yeah, yeah. Here I am. Oh, it's spicy. thrilled. It's thrilled. Like mm. when I, well, when I had a cork in the whole thing and that just popped right off. So I think it's just ready to Ready to get drunk. Yeah, it's saying, Christina, of all the years you could have opened me, you chose 2020 for crying out loud, you know? <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. who wants to um, get us started with the whole history of beer, Christmas beer even? Yeah, well, I can start I by, by giving out to myself because I should have <laughs> made glue beer. Um, <gasps> oh, I did that last year, actually. Yeah. Good. Good. That, blue beer. So I found this recipe um, on Tempest in a Tankard. And um, yeah, I'll link that with our podcast or whatever. Um, so when I've made it before, I made it with a Belgian quad, a whi whiplash, actually, Belgian quad. Because um, the one, the Belgian quad that I used had figs in it, which I just thought sounded like it would go well with the rest of the blue beer ingredients, which were mandarin oranges, cherry juice, and then like basically your typical like, Christmas warming spices, pumpkin spice, that that spice blend. And I just chucked it all in the uh, crock pot. And I really, really liked it, like really, really liked it. But I have to say, last year, I did a Christmas market cruise, which was like oh. the best trip ever. Wow. And um, I drank my 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 body weight, glue vine. <laughs> but um, I was in Regensburg and they had glue beer there and their glue beer was quite different than this glue beer and this recipe that I had. It was not quite as sweet. It was very malty, um, oh. like really bready. It was delicious. I loved it though. And, um, yeah, it was really, really gorgeous. So quite, quite different. Um, but I like them both. Right. So they were both really good in their own way. But I'm kicking myself because I should have made that. But you know, <laughs> I I think I'd like to try. That. I might try making that. It's it's good. It's really good. Mm. I did it last year. We'll just have to do it for. Oh, I'll, I'll make it for our Chris, the beer ladies Christmas. Ooh. Party. Oh yes, yeah. We can all get the recipe and you know maybe each uh, kind of roll our own as it were mm. and yeah uh, do a tasting. Yeah. Oh, that would be fun, and we can see like what base beer you use and you know how you come up. Oh. I like this oh, idea. That's Let's a good do idea. Yeah, yeah. There, we have we have an activity. So <laughs> yes, we're yeah. like having a party. It's going to be awesome, like all parties now, but it's going to be awesome. Yeah, and we're we're charging a fiver to to come. It's virtual, um, but we're donating all the money to Women's Aid. Yay! Uh, and we're also donating all the money that we've gotten from um, the other uh, brewery uh, virtual brewery tours that we've we've charged like two euro, and we're donating all that money as well to Women's Aid. Oh, that's great! Oh, that's a great cause, yeah. especially with the whole whole lockdown. People are stuck places that they don't yeah. want to be, and they can't yeah. get out. They're in know? lockdown. They're in lockdown yeah. with their abusers. So yeah. women does amazing stuff to to get to get people out of those horrific situations. And so, um, especially with Christmas, Christmas is a, also a terrible season for for um, people who are abused. So you know, um, if you're out there and you're listening, donate to Women's Aid. <laughs> Yay. And you can do it and come have fun at the same time. But you know, you can definitely make a difference while you're enjoying a drink or two. So yeah, and we're gonna have a fun pub quiz. So. The the grand prize is bragging rights and uh, <laughs> a million imaginary internet points. <laughs> imaginary internet points are good. Well, I guess though, thinking about our, our topic at hand, should we start with some Vikings? I feel like you yes. can oh, yeah. we can start with Vikings. Um 
I, I can I can start with some of my translations. If you want? And then I have I actually I have a uh, I have a specifically Irish question too that you may know about. But let's let's start with some Vikings and then I can throw a curveball in. Yeah. So we can start with Joel um, um, Yule Ale. So um, Yule um, in Old Norse or in Viking time, we're talking about mid November to early January. Um, it was a critical holiday in the Viking belief system, um, and it was associated with complex rituals, including um, something called uh, Yule Blot, which is literally Yule sacrifice. Um, so for these festivities, special beers were brewed and drank and sacrificed to Odin. So, you know, when you're, when you're drinking your beer this holiday season, if you want to pour some out for Odin, um, <laughs> it's always a, always a good idea. So we, we, we know a little bit about Viking um, beer and brewing from later sources. And I'll get into why they're problematic after we sort of see what's in them. Um, so I have the Heimskringa or the sagas of the Old Norse kings. So this was written by um, Snorri Sturluson around... Ooh. 1230 CE. So this is in a Christian context, writing about the Vikings who were not Christian. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about with this particular text is uh, the King Hakon of Norway, who lived around 920, 961. Um, in this saga, Hakon uh, passed, uh, wrote a law. So the, the law is well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh gosh, I'm sure that. Do we want to do the opening of Beowulf now? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are some Icelandic people going. Oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my she absolutely butchered that. But for those of you who um, who don't speak um, Icelandic or Old Norse, I did it great. It was perfect. <laughs> Your cadence was beautiful. I liked it very much. Um, yeah. So, so I've translated. So this is Old Norse, and I've translated that um, to basically quote: "And every man is obligated to have a measure of ale, or gijal de fe era, or else they have to pay fe, which is the Old Norse for assets, livestock, or money." Um, and melis u is an important phrase, which means measure of ale. Um, and some historians, like uh, Richard Cleesby. Um, and Gudbrand Vigison. Um, so this is about six and a half gallons. So basically what Hakon is saying is that every freeman of a certain status is required to have a certain amount of beer brewed for the Yule festivities. And I'm saying beer, but I'm really meaning ale here. Um, but mm, might be hopped. Um, that's, that's up for debate. Um, but mostly, mostly ale. Um, and this Yule ale became associated with Christmas um, because as this same king commuted the pagan holiday to the, to the Christian one. Um, and this ale is also echoed in other legal codes um, such as the Gullathing Slava, um, which demonstrates not only the importance of both brewing this ale um, and also hosting a really cool party. <laughs> yeah, I love that the party is like enshrined yeah, yeah. in law. You have you to have, have, to have party. the party. Yeah. The party is the big deal. So this law required that free men, again, of a particular rank, had to come together in groups of three to brew ale for ale feasts. Like basically you had to make ale for the party and you had to have this party at the holy night. And if three winters went by and you didn't make your ale and have your party, you forfeited your goods to the last penny. And if yeah. you still didn't do it, which I don't know, how are you going to do this after yeah. you have no goods left? But if you, if you still don't do this after you have no goods left and nothing to brew with, then you're banished from Norway entirely. So, oh. you know, they're not, they're not they're fucking not around here. Yeah. No, Absolutely. you have to brew your beer and have your freaking parties, man. Like that I is think I want to move back to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to, yeah, yeah. to that time. I would, I think I would have liked that aspect of it. Maybe. <laughs> part is not the other yeah. part. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and now while these laws we were seeing, um, saying men and men gathering, um, most scholars like Jenny Hawkins and myself as well um, would probably argue that women were most likely doing the majority of the brewing during the Viking period. Um, this conclusion is based on the saga material and the fact that women just dominated brewing in Europe period full stop in this early medieval period because it was associated with the kitchen and it was a domestic task. So 
I would kind of contend that, but I just, before we move on, I just want to say that the saga materials are really, really problematic to kind of use as, as after I've cited lots of them. <laughs> no, they're, they're kind of problematic because these are written like, they're written by Christian people about pagans and they're written well after everyone in them is, is, is very much dead. So it's kind of like if we wrote like you and I right now wrote about the Napoleonic Wars, but only based on what your great, great grandfather told his son, told his son, told his son, told his son. And then you're kind of just writing this all down. And you know, you have a, you have a completely different religion to the one that they have, and you don't like their religion. And then you write all that down. Like it's fact that would be kind of what they're doing. Um, but, but unfortunately as sources go, the Vikings didn't really write stuff down. I mean, they didn't. So the majority of the textual accounts of the Vikings are these later saga materials. So it's up to us to kind of like pull apart the contemporary bias from the historical accounts. And this is really time consuming, but yeah. very important. Um, and yeah, and we'll get into more saga, um, more saga examples later. Cause there's some fun stories about the Vikings and beer. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I want to rewind a little bit to an Irish saint who had a not fun attitude toward all of this sort of, uh, drinking to uh you know to all the pagan gods at this time of year now we're a little earlier so i i did the research on this years ago so if i pronounce anything wrong this is my bad but uh, so saint columbanus different from saint columba but saint columbanus is this sixth century irish missionary so he goes off to france well what's now france and germany and gets very exercised about people having their christmas beer to vote on and it goes around like smashing casks of it like "Uh uh-uh we don't do that here but how weird is that but it's interesting it's a similar tradition not 100% the same a little bit earlier so it is and again the same kind of idea that it's all seen through this other lens but it's a closer contemporary at least or more closely contemporary you know sort of uh, evidence that people are doing this and have this sort of sacred beer at this time of year again different group of people very very broadly kind of sort of tangentially related but you know, same God, different lens, still only has the one eye. So it's, uh, but it's an interesting thing. Like, you, you know, you don't think, um, it just seems so out of character, doesn't it? He, he leaves Ireland and goes off to be boring other places oh. instead of like <laughs> breaking the crack. So. Well, and it's, it's also interesting because I mean, of course in Ireland, we have ale feasts at that time Mm-hmm. Any, anyway so uh, of course but they're they're in a christian context exactly. so the ones that he would the ones that he would allow but you know saint bridget was brewing beer for the easter ale feast like this was absolutely a thing exactly. in ireland and he he didn't have a problem with the ale probably yeah. he had a problem with um, but, but to whom yeah yeah well although i would say some 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 monks did have a problem with 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 drinking um it's actually quite funny. There was a there was a war, like a war of words, if you will, <laughs> between two um, two monks in this re- Reformation thing in in the early medieval period. And one of the monks was like, "No, you can't drink ale. This is bad. Blah blah blah. This is terrible." And the other monk is like, hmm, "My brothers are going to get into heaven just like you." <laughs> Um, you know, so that was that and he, they were drinking and that was the end of that. So it's just, it's funny, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so and, catty, isn't it? Oh, they were so yeah. catty. Oh. oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and then, you know, parts of it sort of, you know, go into, into Britain and then even later into North America, if you're sort of seeing how this tradition comes down, you know, through the centuries, you, you end up with sort of was hail. And, but even, even what's, what's actually kind of interesting is a lot of the early American or early North American early North American white people recipes are Swedish settlers and they're still throwing in their juniper. They're throwing in things that are very common Scandinavian things that you think, you know, a lot of these must have been passed down just because they were the ingredients that were accessible. They were what you had that was good to throw in your, you know, in your boil in winter. So they kind of brought that along. And it's some of the the earliest, um, not the very earliest, but some of the earliest uh, sort of written recipes we have for North American brewing are from these Swedish uh, settlers who were like, hey, there's juniper here too. Let's do this. So it's it's interesting. Bits and pieces of the tradition still uh, filter through. Absolutely. 
it's it's very interesting um how how long this sort of the sort of idea of Christmas beer kind of has existed and how it's been reincarnated in so many different forms on how, you know, we have Christmas beer now, which is absolutely a part of our celebration. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, there's other sort of, you know, I, I think it's a question of when does, when does your sort of holiday beer, your sort of winter beer, when does it become sort of spiced? Because this is like, and when does it, when does sort of spiced become how we would describe it apart from what well, we just, through whatever we always did in like it's you know when did that become seasonal if you like as yeah. a differentiator it's it's something i think we we have some ideas about but we don't really have a great cutoff point if you like yeah no i think that's a really interesting question when mm -hmm. did when was the spice a conscious tie exactly. to the christmas season as opposed to just what we put in the beer for reasons mm. exactly exactly because yeah. it works so well doesn't it with the season and the um, but we're, but it also kind of just reminds us of the season, like we, yeah. which you know which came yeah. first was it just that we associated with it or yeah and I think. Really I think it really depends on the spice because like the pumpkin spice is the traditional like sweet spice which has been used for centuries and centuries and centuries and all kinds of pies and cakes and things like that so that sweet spice is something that we've had in our palates as Europeans for a long 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 time and it's been used in many different things um particularly like sweet things i mean it's really funny in the medieval period we're talking about i mean they would use spices to show their wealth and they would make things so like so spiced you could barely eat them like that the thing was to just demonstrate how wealthy like, i am were. so fancy look at all this stuff i'm just tossing in yeah I, I, gross, but yeah it's conspicuous destruction it's basically like <laughs> look at all this stuff I can throw around mace for days yeah <laughs> there was there was an element of preservation with it as well though, wasn't there with the yes depending yeah, depending on the spices and, yeah, but yeah. I mean you're talking about like things where they'd have like um sweetened spices sort of at the end of, of meals mm -hmm. and and really um oh there's a really good book I think it's called out of the east that's about the spice trade and the use of spices in the medieval period and it's one of the most interesting books I've ever read um even if you're not a historian like it's it's not really written for just historians it's it's a very like accessible book and I really highly recommend it if you are interested in more about um spices um i think my favorite spice is ambergris which is you know like whale vomit yeah <laughs> yeah i have a i have a brother-in-law who walks the beaches on uh, uh, hoping that he's going to come across a lump of ambergris <laughs> in west Clare. Just, uh, really? hey aunt <laughs> <laughs> enjoy walking the beaches <laughs> How funny. That, that's really a thing yeah. Actually, yeah. Kind of, yeah, it was a very valuable spice, actually. Really? In it, it's period. used as a as a base in in perfumes, isn't it? Perfume, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 it's quite expensive. Yeah, absolutely. And and then there's an interesting question too, because I, I I remember when the Oxford Companion to Beer came out, there was well, there were two or three schisms on. on beer internet when, when it first came out about certain topics and were they well researched enough and anyway it, like you would get in any academic publication because <laughs> reasons that's fine it's good to have it's good to have you know what, what do we call it a rich debate or something like that but there was a whole thing about sort of christmas beers and oh well they couldn't have been christmas beers if they had hops because if you warmed a beer and that had hops it would be gross and disgusting it's like well but also you're looking at that through a very modern lens and you know again like thinking of earlier examples we know that like um hildegard von bingen was like hops yeah let's do it so to say that no one ever heated up uh, uh, you know of a cold winter night whatever beer they happen to have whether that was hopped or not seems a little bit of an assumption but i do think it's something that we could dig into a little more just sort of you know again from a sort of historian's perspective is you know wh which of these spices you know actually went into the boil like went, went into making the beer and which ones were things you put in after like as some sort of mulling spice like was there a difference there um obviously there would be regional variations but i, I don't know if we've really gotten to a good a, a sort of well-reasoned argument either way on that one but i feel like i bet they're two very different things but yeah i mean I, yeah i'd be fascinated i would really really depend on the time period like I, I really would not imagine that we'd find sort of sources for that 
for for the older stuff. Yeah. But but I'd be really interested to see sort of like early modern. If we could find early modern, that would be amazing. Um, when I'm saying early modern, for those of you who aren't historians, I mean post 1500 to about 1800. Um, the early modern period. <laughs> And if we yeah. did find a documented like uh, description, I'm wondering we could we could as the beer ladies try and brew it ourselves. Oh, absolutely! Mm-hmm. How cool yeah. would that be? Oh, very cool! And and because I'm putting together actually a, a medieval Irish beer at the moment based oh. on um, records that I've I've found. Um, for brews um and in various places actually um and i actually just found this really interesting malt bill um or grain bill i should say for for a brew from a particular priory um so it's it's so much fun kind of putting it all together so we could i mean from the medieval period or the viking period you could absolutely put something together you'd be guessing for a lot of it um, <laughs> uh, sorry <clears throat> as an academic i would say we would be making meaningful conclusions based on the data <laughs> an education guess basically mm. we're Absolutely. speculating but it's fun you know i mean that's that's why i like being a medievalist because a lot of it really is just guessing <laughs> <laughs> but it's the right kind of guessing that's it's it's point. yes it's fun guessing Absolutely. It's informed guessing. Yeah, you have to be able to argue your guess. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing about historians it. is if, there, if there's a historian saying anything about anything at any point ever, there's another historian saying the exact opposite of that point for reasons. <laughs> exactly, absolutely. And, and it's funny, too, because it's actually relatively early on in sort of very, very commercial beer production that you get branded christmas or winter beers like people were doing that as soon as they realized wait i can make my beer in a factory and you know have it you know come out consistently the other end like that was a very you know relatively speaking sort of early like oh we should do that to increase sales at this time of year so it's it's nothing new it's it's really it it, and and i think it's interesting too that you know throughout sort of like over the decades you know sort of from the 19th century onward as certain beer styles began to fall out of favor people be like okay the less popular stuff we're going to save for Christmas and then that's going to be our winter, our fancy winter beer. So it, it's actually very clever when you think about, mm. you know, someone sitting there looking at their figures being, uh, no one likes Burton Ale anymore. What do we do? I know we're going to save that all up for winter. Cause again, it's not super hopped. Just so you could, you know, be like, Oh, it's meant to taste like whatever it tastes like. after, <laughs> You know, however long. And if it's strong enough, it might be good. So, Maybe, yeah. you know, being able to rebrand what's not selling, I think, mm-hmm. has been, uh, has always been in the industry, even if it's, I, I feel like we see less of the things being Christmas now and more like, this is our sour. We meant to do this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's a wild fermentation, you know, all of that. Yeah. It's like the first sour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what happened? And then someone walks in and goes, I can drink this. And I'm like, you can? Okay. Yeah. Let's try it. Yeah, you it was completely intentional. Yes. It, yeah. it, it, the, the brewery did not get infected. What are you talking about? <laughs> this was, we planned it. We're a sour brewery now forever. We planned this whole thing. Yeah, we can't get rid of this wild yeast. This is us now. Yeah. <laughs> we had, when I first started going out with my husband, he was, we, we do brew it now, but he was big into brewing and he had this batch of, I can't even remember what it was. It was in a demijohn. Nobody would drink it. <laughs> and then um, nobody liked it and I tasted it and I, I actually quite liked it but he, he's fairly certain something went wrong but you know it was I didn't, in fairness I didn't end up finishing the whole thing but but nobody else was drinking and I'm, I'm sure it wasn't just you know that I was trying to keep him, keep him sweet <laughs> or anything but it was funny though yeah well if we're talking about beer that's uh brewed with with some some interesting ingredients um we we can I can circle back actually to to a story I'd like to tell you about yeah. uh, about the Vikings. Um, so we have the story of Alaric and his wives, and I yes, I mean wives too mm-hmm. at the same time. Wives. Ooh, shocking. 
So Alric was married to, to one woman and then he, you know, he's just walking around and he sees this other woman um, named Gerhild and he's like, wow, she's so beautiful. And she was brewing this ale and he's like, yep, I'm going to marry her too. I'm going to have two wives. <laughs> this is going to work out real well. So obviously his first wife is like, uh, no, <laughs> this is, I'm not, I'm not happy with this. So they, they're like fighting back and forth. And so the king is like, Listen, I can't, I can't stay married to you because, because on account of their squabbles. This is what, <laughs> and so he's like, so he decides that he's gonna, he's gonna keep the one who makes him the best ale when he comes home from summer raiding. Oh, it's all right for some. Seems, seems like a great way. How to, open-minded of him to choose <laughs> to choose your wife. So, so you know, the women are both brewing Signy and Gerhild, and um, so Gerhild she entreats with with Odin, and Odin decides to bless her by spitting on her yeast. Hey. Um, so obviously she won, right? So she she won she won the contest, and she she gets to remain you know his wife to the guy because he's a catch who makes, I mean, who makes no, Meryl. Yeah, I mean, he makes marital decisions based on brewing prowess. I mean, it's really the kind of guy you want to see married to. So, um, gay for Gerhild? When really, like, these two women could have gone off and brewed amazing beer and just lived their best lives. Really, that's what they should have done. I mean, because it's easy. I mean, the Vikings, you could divorce. I don't know why they just didn't. They both just didn't. I mean, honestly, like, we know this didn't happen, right? Like, right. this is not actually a real thing that happened. You, you because... mean Odin didn't spit on it? Oh, the, no. You made well, that bit well, see, that's not the bit that I think. I think that bit is more realistic than two women being like, "I want to stay married oh, yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. of a gentleman yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. who's brought home his second wife when I could divorce him." No, 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 no. But I think it just basically demonstrates, of course, that women were brewing. But I just think it's a really fun story. Um, a fun story to 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 kind of tell. Um, they 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 do like their stories. Um, they're really good at like oh the the Viking sagas. I just highly recommend them if if you if you want a good story, they're good stories. Yeah, they are a lot of fun, and there's some great translations out there now. Like that, there used to not be, but there are now. So, and you can get them for free online, like pretty easily. Um, yeah, the translations and everything. Um. I think, and, and, and we know that women were really associated with not even just brewing beer, but serving it. So there was a lot of ritual importance around serving ale in, in the Viking period. This was a huge deal um, to the point where um, bowls and, and sort of ladles, these are associated with like hegemonic femininities and we find these in graves. So th this is like a really important part of sort of status and social status and hosting events. So when you'd host an event in a house, the, the the wife or the highest status woman there would serve the guest beer from from a ladle. Um, and so we can find this this sort of act of serving ale quite common throughout the the Viking sort of text. And I think my favorite example is um, the the story of Attila the Hun and his wife Gun Gundrun. Um, so Attila marries th this woman named Guthrun and he, he kills her, her brothers. So her brothers came over to, so, so basically here's the story. Attila marries <laughs> Guthrun and then he, he kind of lures her brothers over and the brothers are like, listen, I know this is a trap, but for some reason they feel the need to go anyway. Who knows? So they're there, and then Attila is trying to get information about some sort of treasure out of out of her brothers. And, you know, it doesn't work. Um, one of the brothers has his heart cut out, and while he's doing it, he's singing about it. And the other brother is like, okay, I know my other brother's dead, so now you can feel free to just off me because I'm going, I'm going to my grave with this. I'm not telling you. So, you know, Guthrun is like really pissed about this because it's her brothers, right? So, so, you know, she, she does what any normal person would do. She slaughters her sons that she had with Attila and oh, feeds please. them to him. We've all been there. Wow. I mean, yeah. 
so so it's this whole thing where Attila comes ha- home and Guthrie comes out with the little golden beaker of ale and then she, she you know she's coming in and she says thou mayest eat now chieftain within thy dwelling young beasts fresh slaughtered come eat come eat and then he's eating and he's eating and he's eating and she's like hey you're eating your kids like funny story by the way and so then the whole hall like goes to weeping and crying and you know carrying on and so she frees all the slaves um and then she gives away all of his wealth and then atlee you know gets really drunk and passes out and so then she slaughters him and then she burns the entire hall to ash with those remaining inside you know i really just picture this as one of those action movies where there's like the explosion (laughs) behind her and she's just walking away (laughs) i'm really thinking i'm getting a real like uh premenstrual vibe from her (laughs) <laughs> she's like not today. <laughs> not today not today Satan. um uh, like not obviously don't advocate you know killing and eating your children but it is a very good story <laughs> and you know it, it happens so often in you know myth and you know it is it's quite a common stuff. trope yeah yeah you've got Medea off doing some pretty similar stuff i mean it's you know it's what people do in the olden times we don't do yeah, that now that would be unseemly don't. Yeah. and an eagle i think there might be, among yeah, other things there will be yeah consequences <laughs> <laughs> we don't do it because it's unseemly <laughs> well, i mean think of the neighbors you know i mean <laughs> you'll never bring twitching, another those, casserole over again those twitch and net curtains you know they notice everything yeah. these days absolutely Oh my goodness. Uh, that's a great story, but yeah. Mm. That is a good story. Yep. So that that was the end of Attila the Hun. <laughs> I'm oh, wondering well. how she turned the kids. Did she just use like their blood in the ale or did she? Oh no, she fed it to them. So like she she made like she cooked them. Oh she, okay. <laughs> So this is so like, like the whole like the cook, the thief, his wife, and her lover kind of a yeah. Kind of so a, so she 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 came out with with the beaker of ale, and then she was like, "Come eat, come eat all this uh, lovely meat that we have." And the lovely meat was, you know, his kids. I thought for a second that that they were in the the ale somehow, but okay, that makes a little bit more sense. <laughs> out of like, completely well, I mean, reasonable I mean, story. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, we talked about Hathor, who had like the blood beer, so like, yeah, I didn't really put it past anyone to kind of make that kind of a. I'm sure someone in history has made blood beer out of the, the <laughs> blood of their enemies. That's true enough. I mean, you have people drinking out of skulls. I mean, that happens all over the place. Oh, I so. know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Common, common thing to to make a, yeah. a drinking glass out of the skull of your enemy. Less ferment- fermentable sugar, though. That would be a tricky, you mm-hmm. know. A tricky thing to do i like the way you're you're taking the the you know the holistic approach to the, <laughs> the effect the blood would have on, on the beer <laughs> it's just not going to turn out well i think <laughs> i think i think lisa i think like we were talking uh, you were talking about earlier i think it's an it's an after the boil sort uh, of yes maybe yeah. you sort of toss a bit in you know yeah. almost uh you know almost like people who put in a little tabasco if they're having a you know a, a bad hangover you know or or oh, when okay. you put in when you put in like um black black currant into guinness like i think oh, you yeah. can kind of probably just do it like that just dump a little in after the beer <laughs> so just a is bit already of made a bit of seasoning bit of seasoning yeah, yeah. exactly okay. <laughs> do not try at home <laughs> Important pro tip. and once again we've devolved into chaos <laughs> oh, oh well uh, not at all, not at all. No, no, we've got a lot of uh, we've got a lot of other interesting things we can we can talk about. But should, should we take a break and get a? I was just gonna say, yeah. Well, yep. Will we have a time for a beer break? And we'll yes, be right we'll back. Have a, perfect. Yeah, beer break. Hey. hey, this is Bean, and you're listening to the Beer Ladies Podcast. We are back from our beer break. So let's see again what everybody is drinking. Christina, what have you got? I, I'm drinking the same thing oh, because if you're if, working if, your way through it. If um if you're listening and not watching, this is a massive freaking bottle and this is eight point five percent. So I'm uh, 
Uh, I, it's, yeah, it's a 750 mil, and I've I've got to work tomorrow, so you know, <laughs> this is all I'm drinking. Fair. Casey, how about you? I am. Um, I've moved on to the. This is a. Ah, I just can you see that? Yeah. If you're watching it's on YouTube, brew. it's Stop Brew collaboration with Craft Central, Ooh. and it's called a Barrel Age Central Perk, and it's a barrel aged, barrel aged pale aged in PX Sherry. I don't know what PX means. For 18 months, blended with a pale aged in bourbon for six months. Ooh. It's Pedro Jimenez. Is oh, is that what, yes. oh, that's the type of sherry. Uh, yeah. it, yes, it's the type of cask it's in. So I, I only know this for reasons. I don't know much about it. <laughs> <laughs> I know the name. I know, I know, like Harvey's Bristol Cream is about as close to a sherry as <laughs> I've ever come, you know? <laughs> I only know it from uh, going to enough virtual whiskey tastings with the lovely people at El Mulligan uh, from the whiskey shop. Oh, I must oh. Do so. They're really good. They're doing a year-end one. I'm sure it's sold out already yeah. but oh they they do such a good job of explaining things for people who are like relative newbies like me i'm like i know a thing now yeah. like one thing. Oh. <laughs> that will come in handy in a pub oh. quiz someday you know yes. that right yeah, yeah. absolutely and they do tend to i mean as as we beer nerdy people do we'll sort of fall into a shorthand they'll they will eventually be like oh the like you said the sort of px and you know, i'm like i know what it is i know what it is yes <laughs> and i finally got back there so achievement unlocked but <laughs> Oh, uh, what about you, Joanne? I have a Van Bricks Brit Ale. Oh, so always so good. This is my, this is from my beer advent calendar from Beer Club. No, <laughs> no, no, the Beer Club. Sorry. Beer Club. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I haven't, I haven't actually tried this one yet. It's one of the new ones I, I love it. You know, it's one of my go-tos now. They, I feel like they just do such a good job across mm, the board. They do. And they're so nice. Mm. And, oh, um, yeah. I love Belly Kill Cabin. I don't think I've ever had a beer from them that I didn't like, oh. to be honest with you. Oh. This is very Moorish. It's just oh, so. Oh, that is really good. Yeah. yeah. I have one of them in the fridge right now, and I'm really tempted to, to have I, it. I've got it. their there's their current special, their walnut whip. Uh, oh, did you one, get one? Saving that for the weekend. It's I up, well. It's up there. <laughs> <laughs> I had to I had to send out for it, so I I, mm. I I sent out reinforcements to go pick it up. I almost did a click and collect and like frog marched one of my children over there, but then I was like, you know, it's cold. Maybe not this weekend. Mm. <laughs> Well, what else are children for, you know? I mean, you need to get Unless them Unless you're going to cook them. Right? Cook them and feed them to your husband. They're, they're for eating, Katie. They're for <laughs> eating. Yeah. I don't, mine are so thin. I feel like it's not, you know, it's not worth the effort. That's what Christmas is for, Lisa. <laughs> to, to be fair, they have been eating a lot more donuts lately, but they're, still, they're just skinny. They have metabolisms like, you know, I don't have that, but there you go. Have they discovered the Irish advent calendar, the chocolate well, we don't have a chocolate one. We have a Lego one. So. Okay. I saw that. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was cool. Yeah, that's cool. I yeah, love it. The tea one. Mm. Oh, the tea one sounds. Is that? Did you say tea pigs? Is that what it's, I saw? It's tea pigs. Although what I have heard is that come the thirty first of December, it may be a lot harder to get all of their stuff here because they're coming from the UK yeah. and their distribution may just be a complete disaster after that. So who knows? That's what I'm worried about. I'm like, how how am I gonna buy anything anymore? I buy most I've, of my stuff from the UK. Like, what am I've I? Been what am I gonna do? Shopping for like stuff that I don't want to run out of from Amazon, but well, then you're just gonna have to buy Irish and find it a better <laughs> product here, okay? I guess it is exactly. You know, exactly. we can do it with beer. We can do it with tea. <laughs> That is true. That oh is no, true. there's some actually really amazing Irish teas. That yeah, yeah there we, are. We have there are. Tea. There are. And in fact, yeah, I just got a bunch of tea from uh, Loose Leaf in Cork. I'm very pleased with that. So that's nice. And I will say, I ordered it on like Sunday and it turned up like Monday afternoon. Oh, so yeah. can't complain about the service. All mm -hmm. all good. So drinking wise, though, I have the third circle needs more cowbell because I know mm -hmm. everyone is doing ridiculous stouts this winter. This is actually a Tonka bean milk stout. Uh, I also have their maple bacon Porter. I did not. They have a third one, I think, that is spicy. Yeah, that is something spicy. I didn't see that one, though, but I do have the Wicklow Wolf one that I'm saving for for this weekend. But speaking of the Craft Central advent calendar, I had uh, a little bird tell me that a lot more thought had gone into it than I realized that they have they've um, they've done all of these sort of beer allocations that all the really strong ones are ones you're going to open up at the weekend. Uh, and everything that's a little more oh. during the week. So if you are 
trying to keep up and have one every day, which I, I'm not. I can't because yeah. I'm tired. <laughs> um, but I was like, that's so That's nice. really thoughtful. Mm-hmm. Yes, that they were like, mm-hmm. you know, let's put the 10% one on a Friday or Saturday night, and then everything else is going to be, you know, much more accessible. Oh. I was like, that's a really good idea. Yeah. So, yeah, that's actually great. A brilliant, brilliant yeah. idea. So, and I got, I didn't even know that until someone told me. So, Craft Central, show your work. Tell people that you've done this clever thing. This is, this is, yeah. Great. That is something that they should brag about. Brag about that. Yes, please do. (laughs) Yes. Oh, and then they should have had two advent calendars. So they should have had, should have one for the shift workers, like nurses and guards that would go to coppers on a Monday night. That's a good idea. (laughs) Not that that's happening at the moment. I know. (laughs) How are the guards and the nurses getting together? I want to know. Do you know, that's it. My sister (laughs) is a guard and she's married to a guard and she met her. Well, I think they met at work, but they got together in coppers anyway. Yeah. Right, just, I hope she doesn't mind me telling that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what if I tell anyone? One of our very own, <laughs> one of our very own got together in coppers, right? Sarah and, and Seamus. Oh, did they? I think they did. I think uh, they did. Yeah. Oh, I, did, I didn't know that. Actually, my other sister met her husband in coppers. My younger <laughs> sister. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I went to see the musical um last year in in the Olympia cup uh cup face jacks the musical yeah yeah really entertaining yeah. actually what oh my god Wait, there's a idea. musical yeah what? Oh, did you miss that yeah yeah there was yeah. oh my god yeah. wow i have it was to... really funky the dolphin had had a had a role in it as well funky the dolphin oh. starred <laughs> and now he's gone missing because of covid and coppers oh. is gone because of covid and oh the whole world has turned on its head well, uh, fuck 2020. Uh, yeah. yeah, we're almost through. We're almost through. We just gotta keep powering on. Yeah, I mean, I can live without coppers. Yeah, so, really. That's not. Yeah, that's yeah. A, it's not breaking my heart to be honest with no. you that I can't go to coppers. No, like I'm in my 40s, but I feel sorry for like my son there, who's 19, who's like he's never. He can't be a gold ticket holder, you know? Or... Yeah. <laughs> no, well, you know, everyone should experience, everyone should experience the w- magic that is coppers at least mm-hmm. once, mm-hmm. at least once in their lives. And yeah, yeah, it is, it is kind of, it's a bit shit for the young kids oh. that they can't get out and kind of do all that stupid fucking shit that we all did when we were young, you know? God, I, I've only been there once, and this was years ago when I was first here on a work due, which I guess is how this all yeah. happens. And I think we ended up there after going through like everywhere in Temple Bar, like awful, awful touristy stuff. And I just remember having a very intense- So you went to conference. God, with this, with this also very intense Scottish guy who was like, I want to marry Nicola Sturgeon. And I was like, that's great. She's fantastic. <laughs> and you know, that's the kind of conversation you have, right? At like three in the morning with someone you've just met who was like, who's like, we're just going to keep talking very loudly at each other because it's loud. <laughs> and that was, yeah. And and then I was not very well the next morning and had to change my tickets to go see the Book of Kells. So lesson learned, don't, don't do that. <laughs> and I was like a grown ass adult doing that. So don't, you know, but you I know, I wasn't ever, paying I, for it. Work was paying for that. So I was only ever in my late twenties, late twenties when I first went to conference because I didn't I went to uni in England, so I never, right. uh, never did it here. So yeah, yeah. So I, I, I escaped from the country and went to college in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, did it open my eyes! <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I was in my mid twenties when I went to Coppers because I moved here in my mid twenties and I it was one of the first places that I went to, but um in my early you know in my early in my early you know post high school sort of college days I went to the the very many and frequent um, West Virginia equivalents of <laughs> Coppers. <laughs> um, there's, the, there's one everywhere. Yeah, the only difference was that they were cheaper. Um, yeah. we had, we yeah. had like penny pitcher nights, which is, uh, a oh, wow. magical, magical thing. We had, we had a student, I lived on campus for my first year and we had a student union bar and at the end of the year, they had a, had an event called drink the bar dry where everything was just dirt cheap. <laughs> that was where I was introduced to snake bite and oh yeah, that was a bit messy, but had to be done, you know. Um, yeah, we're not promoting binge drinking. Don't no, binge no, drink. No, we're not. No, we're not. No. <laughs> no. 
no. <laughs> Important lessons learned. Do not. <laughs> yes. Uh, do 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 as I say, not as I did. Although, although it's actually a perfect segue to tell a different Christmas beer story. Oh. Tell us more, Lisa. Gather round, children. So, <laughs> cast your mind back to 1926. Christmas beers are dark, they're heavy, they're malty, they're spicy. But you, you clever Belgian marketing person are like, what if? What if we made a lager for Christmas that was so shiny and sparkly it looked like a beautiful star? Ah. Ah. Oh. And lo, that is how Stella Artois was <laughs> So Stella wow. was originally made to be a fancy ass Christmas beer. And you know, they put the, you know, the the, the sort of again fakety fake branding on it. I, I don't think they put the 1366 on it back then because Come on, guys. But I think they did try to tie it back to the, the brewer who had been brewing on the site, not at the same, you know, sort of the same uh, legal entity, if you like. But uh, it is actually named after the brewer who was brewing on the same site in the 18th century. But then they were like, well, there's been a brewery here forever. We'll just we'll just keep going back and going back. But yeah, originally... Stella was brewed for Christmas and to be this fancy thing that you would have once a year, this beautiful pale lager that was so shimmery and shiny and it was going to be expensive and it was going to be something you'd have just as, you know, for those fancy occasions. And, and then it ended up being the beer on men behaving badly. So I, I feel like it's, <laughs> it's, it's, the, the, wife, I want, the wife beater. Apparently. The wife beater. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I wonder how long it lasted uh, as being kind of um you know, shiny and shimmery that's a really interesting question because i have tried to find that actually like at what point were they like uh lads we've you know given up on this fancy thing like just yeah you know but i i think for at least a good sort of 10 years or so they were like once a year fancy and then they were like wait we can just keep churning this out and it could be really cheap and you know fantastic but I, I think it's Stella is such an interesting beer for you know the other reason too which is that you know everyone in Europe has always thought of it as like cheap lager but in America they they you know positioned it as this fancy beer that Europeans drink and like <laughs> you're like wait what <laughs> and then you walk into a bar in the UK and, and you... right <laughs> that, that was what that was the lager I started drinking I exactly. drank cider before I went to the UK and I didn't yeah. like their cider so I started drinking Stella <laughs> And I first, you know, properly came across Stella in the 90s. And so my first association with it is 100% like Martin Clunes on the telly. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and that was they would have like the case of, you know, the, the cardboard box of Stella on someone's head. And, you know, so I, I never had that like positive association with it. But I, I still think it's fascinating that not only did they brew it as kind of an interesting one off Christmas beer that like they had this like fakey fake branding about it even you know in the 1920s mm. that was just part of this prepackaged story and yeah. that they understood how important storytelling was in kind of you know positioning the beer and then at some point they're like eh so what we'll just sell we'll stuff we'll just make money yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but i think it's so interesting that you know it's sort of like you wouldn't think of it as a christmas beer now no, because no. it doesn't look like a christmas no. beer it doesn't taste like a christmas beer it's just it's just cheap mm. lager. So it's, but then, and, and Joanne, you, you're on the good, fancy, expensive lager for Christmas. So, you know, you go to your Santa Claus, mm. very different. Yeah, yeah. How much have you gotten through? Oh, oh I, I finished it. I'm on my bumblebees now, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. I, I do have kind of a, a funny, um, a funny Santa Claus story too, apart from the one with the trains, because that was, don't do that, kids. Again, that's <laughs> don't, don't do that. But um, it was originally made by the Harleman Brewery in Switzerland, and it's only again relatively recent, since 1980. That's when it was originally brewed. But actually, let's see, what's today? Is we're recording this. This is the eighth, so we're just after Saint Nicholas's Day. But they, I think, even now, when it's brewed in Austria, they brew it on Saint Nicholas's Day, and then it's lagered mm. for a full year. But Originally, it was the Herleman Brewery in uh, in Zurich, and last year I went again when travel was a thing, and stayed at the hotel that is in the former Herleman Brewery, and it's a spa hotel and it's amazing. And if uh, I don't know why else you would go to Zurich, but if you happen to be there, 
highly recommend going to the hotel because they actually did a really good job sort of documenting the history of the brewery. If you go to the gym, there's all these photos of like what the brewery looked like at its prime. There's a lot of sort of uh, not quite merchandise, but little nods in the room to like Sammy Klaus and to some of the other beers that they brewed. And you're like, oh, that's really nice. But most importantly, they have this enormous spa that's made to look like it's in old beer vats. It, it obviously is not, but it looks like it. And I'm like, guys, you know, I'm here for the design. Yeah, yeah, that's... You know, <laughs> I'd be there. I'm gone for it. And you can. Oh, they're all these. Yeah, so you're just like hanging out in the hot water, mm. you know. And again, it looks like you're in a giant barrel. It's all good. Mm. But it, they've done a really pretty good job mixing it together now. And I, I looked up their website again to to sort of see, oh, did they say anything else about the Santa Claus or about some of the other beers? But uh, at the moment, they're just uh, advertising themselves as being 99% germ-free. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> how are we quantifying that? They are moving with the times, <laughs> okay? <laughs> 2020 is the year to be practically germ-free, okay? Well, and, and fair play, but I'm also like, <laughs> how are we doing Where are we getting the 99? Right, and what's, <laughs> how are we measuring this? I have many questions. It's not the same way the condom companies measure that they're, <laughs> what, 99% effective. Right, exactly. That's proper <laughs> use, use right? so, so correctly. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Oh, well, yeah, there is that when used correctly. That's the thing. Right. <laughs> that thing they sort of brush over in school, yeah, yeah. like, eh, they'll figure it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh no, we have we practice we have them these um polystyrene. Really? Wow. We practice putting... You were a city oh. school. I was a country school. We got nothing. <laughs> no, we were just told what would happen if, if we made a boy feel sad. Like literally, that was what? you know Catholic well, because school. I went to an all girl oh. Catholic yeah. school and we were told oh. well we were first of all told that nothing unfortunate unfortunate was the big, you know euphemism for everything would happen to a good girl obviously i mean but also that uh what to do if a boy gets fresh and again this is in the 80s early 90s like come on so what you want to do if a boy gets fresh is you put your hand out and for, for those who are just listening i am putting my hand out you put your hand up but you also nod your head at the same time because you don't want to hurt his feelings and say no oh. And I can remember even being like 15 and being like, well, wait, oh. wait, wait, what? Oh. <laughs> and, and I you know, ra remember raising my hand to one of the nuns and being like, well, isn't this sort of sending mixed messages? Like what, you know, and they're like, well, no good girl would find herself in this position anyway. This is just, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, my bad. But uh, so they had a point of view. You don't question the nuns. So, so that's rape culture 101. Oh my god. Well, I, I think really the highlight of my all-girl Catholic education was we, we had a textbook um, called Love and Marriage because that is your ultimate goal, obviously, as exactly as a human female. Yeah. Uh, because you have no higher aspiration. Absolutely. But it, it had a whole section on uh, how you know all contraception is bad especially chemical things, because that will give you a chemical baby. I don't know what a chemical baby is, but that was on the test. Um, but also that evil homosexuals are polluting this country's blood supply, because it was all very American, gung-ho as well. And it was it was not subtle in any of its... <laughs> Whoa. Wow, that is some brazen homophobia there. Oh, I mean, it was, and that was I don't know why I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not a surprise, but it was, uh, it was very, very out there, and uh, they, it didn't hold back. And we were all tested on it, and you had to say the right things on your exams, or you could fail religion, and then, uh, wow, yeah, wow. that would affect your GPA. You might not get into the right college if you uh, were like, really? if you were a bad Catholic. Exactly. If you had a mind of your own. <laughs> that, that's great, because I remember yeah. our, in primary school, we had a kind of sex ed. It wasn't really right. sex ed. It was just about periods and stuff. Right. But um, there was no there was no mention of the church. There was nothing like any oh, of that. They just kind of, yeah, which, which I find crazy. But oh, my God. I cannot <laughs> imagine. Well, I did go to a Catholic school, but yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> I cannot I, imagine. I must have had sex ed. I had... Mm -hmm. I don't, we never had sex ed. It was junior science. 
biology. Okay, well, biology. I, 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 I had biology. Like I had biology, yeah. but I don't, I know that we had sex ed, but I cannot for the life of you remember anything that I learned in it. And oh, we also went primary school. No way. Like our primary school teacher was ancient. It, it like, wasn't, it wasn't our teacher. It was a oh. nurse who came in. Oh, a professional. She, that's she good. She separated the boys and girls. And, right. Um, it was more about hygiene and kind of talking about periods and she didn't really go into depth about sex but it was right kind of set in the background the it's so like, different from yeah. what they're learning now where they're learning mm-hmm. like about pleasure and orgasms mm-hmm. and like being That's safe true, yeah. and mm-hmm. consent and like all these things that like god i wish i knew like i wish yeah. i la- i mean sorry mm-hmm. i wish i knew i know but i wish i knew then. Yes. like back then, then like you know like yes. actually important information yeah. like how to access abortions if you want one, how to access birth control if your parents will not let you. Um, like these kind of things. These are important things for kids yeah. to know. Like it just it's it's good to see that there's a change. Yeah. Shift yeah. In that. And even like my niece is four and she knows the real words for things. You know, yeah. Like, which that's is good. Yeah. yeah so well, they yeah. say that that's really important yeah. for, for like setting boundaries yeah. and that kind of thing. Absolutely. And and for yeah. like molestation and stuff, yeah. because like if you teach yeah. them euphemisms, then it's like, oh, you know, so and so touched me on my cookie. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, good yeah. luck right. with your cookie. Right. Like, what? Eh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's no, it's great, and it's great that it's not heteronormative anymore. That they're mm-hmm. really trying to get away from mm-hmm. that. I we're we're getting there, folks. I mean, <clears throat> still a long way to go, but yeah. Progress though, progress. Absolutely. It's it's going to be slow as well. When um, I think when when a country, especially in Ireland, where the Catholic Church has such a hold over the country, no, um, not as not as much as they used to. And I think no. if we look at how far we've come in the last yeah. few years, that's it's it's really. Yeah. No, I I was saying this to Paul. Like to me, like. M- there's a lot of people in my life who are Irish who would identify as Catholic, but they're like culturally catholic but yeah. not actually catholic mm. like my husband would be like socially and culturally catholic but not really catholic do you know what mm. i mean like yeah, yeah. like and and that's very common i think yeah, yeah. well I, yeah. I grew up catholic but i would i would identify as no religion to be honest yeah, me, yeah. Me too. yeah. well yeah my my mom um tried to raise me as catholic but it just didn't take <laughs> <laughs> um at all so i'm 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 you know i'm a i'm a i'm a i'm a pagan heathen so you know oh yeah i'm right there with you (laughs) i'm I'm going to hell anyway according to my dad so oh yeah i was trying to tell he means it in in an endearing way that's where all the fun people go joanne i'll be there we'll hang out exactly my mom is very catholic but she like she just kind of has her own version of catholicism Mm -hmm. like she just She just kind of does her own thing where she, you know, she's, she uh, thinks that there's no such thing as hell. Um, she just doesn't think that's a thing. She thinks everyone goes to the great afterlife. She just doesn't, she doesn't think that she, you know, she doesn't believe in, uh, she's, you know, she's pro-choice. Um, she's very much like equal rights for everybody and, and marriage equality and, and all that other stuff. And she's just, she's just her own Catholic. And that just was what works for her. Um, but like, sometimes, you know, she comes and she tells me about like the priest going on about just ridiculous stuff in america like because she, she's, she's in america like just very very conservative sometimes mm-hmm. just ridiculousness yeah well it's all affected by what's around it right like because like where i grew up it was so conservative and so the catholics there are all impacted or affected however you want to look at it by the like super evangelical people so they are their own version of super evangelical and like i can even remember in in probably when I was in like elementary school more than in high school but then being like but we don't really believe in evolution I was like I thought the church was pretty cool with this but like you know people locally being like not really You're like wait what and all these mixed messages it's very and very I suppose confusing. now creationism has has come to the fore and and oh. I like I can't imagine sending my child to a school that that taught creationism rather no. than evolution. and there's so many and it's yeah. nuts and we see the results now where you have all these people like there ain't no virus and you're like well actually there you go no, there, <laughs> there, there is there is um a, there is a there's an epidemic of terminal stupidity in America and it is it, it's it's willful ignorance and it's just oh god 
the COVID has just really, really shown how many people are just, I just, I have no words for them. Just Yeah, the, the anti-science thing is so, it, like, it's always been there. Some of it's religious, some of it's not, but like, it's become so prevalent and it's become so sort of, well, I have my own beliefs. It's like, well, okay, you can have your own beliefs about like, you know, whether or not there's Bigfoot, you don't get to have your own beliefs about like, you know, how cells divide or, you know, just yeah, basic stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like the, you, this is not, this is not up for debate. This is not an argument. You don't, you don't get to, deb- you know, this is a fact. Like okay. this is not, I just don't understand people who think that this is something they get to have an opinion about. Like, oh, you watched a YouTube video? <laughs> Good for you. This person has been doing research as a medical scientist for like, you know, 20 years. I'm pretty sure you watching that one YouTube video, Michaela, is not as good as that <laughs> but i bet it was a really well-produced video yeah. actually no i oh. bet it wasn't it was probably shot by a bunch of teenagers <laughs> oh my god it's probably shot by someone who in their spare time does multi-level marketing and- <laughs> right. i've been reading a lot about multi-level marketing recently oh it's awful just, oh my god but it's fascinating as a, as a sort of weird cultural thing like people get yeah. so so it's it. it's it's so many different ways as well and different yeah. companies they give different slants like i know a few people who are doing multi-level marketing with various different companies who yeah and i'm yeah and i'm like how do you not see that that's <laughs> what this is but, anything yeah. that you have to pay <clears throat> To work for is not a job. You are not a small business owner. <laughs> small business owner. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's what they call themselves. They call themselves mm-hmm. small business owners. Yeah, it's all part of it. Yeah. Um, You're not a small business owner. Mm-mm. Yeah. If you and had thi- to buy the starter kit now. And the thing is, is that those people are probably very talented and creative. And if they put that money into doing something with their yeah. own minds and their own ideas, they could have a shop on Etsy, which would make them. A small business owner. Right. <laughs> but you can't do that in America because you can't buy health insurance and you'd be screwed. So yeah. Anyway. Oh, I mean, like I know I'm I'm a I'm a small business owner and I have no health insurance, but it doesn't matter because I'm in Ireland and I yes. don't need it. Thank you, Ireland. Yes. Ooh, you're <laughs> welcome. I love this country. <laughs> I seriously I love this country, honestly. It's the best. Yeah, like there are there are still flaws with it, but it's it's much better than than the and situation. People are trying. People are the, trying. Yeah, not, people are trying. You know, yeah, yeah that's feel... that's how I always think. I say to my husband, I'm like, Ireland is moving in the right direction. Like, I feel so yeah. positive and uplifted about living here. Like, I've just I I you know just think that it's just going to get better and better and better and better and better. And I'm just so excited to see you know what the young people are doing. Like. I'm saying this like I'm old and I am old, but not that old, but you know, I'm just really interested She's in the youngest here. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Still 34. <laughs> hey kid. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like it's just, it's really inspiring to see what everyone is doing. Um, and just like, just like little things like the toy show when they raise like how many millions in like an hour. Yeah. It's just, it's just, I, I just, impressive, I now I love you. this country. I really, oh my God. I feel and, very lucky to be here. And the way like, again, the toy show, like, oh my God, this was our first year watching. And I was just like, oh my God, just, you know, <laughs> take all my money, please. Oh. I know. <laughs> but it was just, oh, these kids were so inspiring and just, you know, it was just, it was so interesting you know coming from from america where everything is so negative I again mean, yeah, not everything but that's like that's like the national mood to so just see like let's find the positivity in these kids who are you know going through stuff but we're gonna really like like focus on what's going well for them and how we can like uplift them i was like oh this is amazing oh my god i'm so glad we're here i love that yeah. they had adam on on um last week on the late late show and um yes. yeah he zoomed with chris hatfield the the I'm astronaut that, yeah. and, oh it just i don't I know just, I, I think that's one nice thing about living in a small country is like you know when something happens like or you see someone it just whips around social media really fast and like things happen fast to support people and i just think that's wonderful yeah. Oh, it's amazing. And and all, all like all of our little like uh, Christmas decorations, Verity's been and my daughter is six. She's been drawing little hearts like Adams for just oh. everything. And they've been doing that at her school. And I'm like, 
all like all of the kids like the entire like you know under 10 i guess population of the country is all like now drawing little hearts just you know inspired by adam and i was like that's amazing that they're all again taking this positive you know energy and trying to like you know put good things out there in the world like oh if you didn't watch the toy show if you're in america um this this kid adam had these hearts that were like a socially distant hug and he would hold it up um to kind of give to show the other person that he was giving them sort of this socially distant hug it was just like literally the sweetest thing in the world it was yeah, it was amazing and, and again my six-year-old was like he has brittle bones but he's had all of these things that i'm like oh my god you know like this kid's whole medical history and you're like ready to regurgitate it for me but like they have been talking about it at school like they really? are so wow. like yeah. you know well versed and like how can we help you know participate and i'm like oh like it would be nice if you would clean your room too but oh yeah. like, you know. i think i think every child grown up in ireland always wanted to be on the toy show for, yeah. for oh, some yeah. reason testing toys or or uh the billy barry kids yeah oh and, yeah, and I my was husband not... was <laughs> huh? my husband what? was thrilled because the porter from temple street children's hospital because yeah, my husband works it. at temple street children's yeah. hospital he knows him so he was thrilled to see him he was like <laughs> like he's literally apparently he's just he's actually like the nicest person in the world like he's just apparently this porter is just a legend among legends at temple street and so oh. my husband was like oh i know him <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's and it was just i just think it was just the fact that the 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 way adam's face lit up when he saw oh, yeah. Yeah. his favorite porter so from the yeah. hospital yeah. oh my god yeah. Because other kids were like, oh, I want to go to Disney World. And he was like, oh, no, I just want to see my favorite portrait. Oh, I know. That was a right. Oh. It's, it's just, it's so, I mean, that, Adam just, I think, stole all our hearts, to be honest with you. I think he's just the, the sweetest little kid. Yeah, it was amazing. And I know his dad wrote, wrote a book about him and has, has written books for his other kids, too, and too, about, like, you know, I think it's also that, you know, a big conversation of how do you deal, you know, with one kid who has special needs, but you have other kids, too. How do they you know how are they affected by it and yeah. he's like tried to sort of address that too and say hey they're also important and how do we you know oh, that's how do wonderful you... yeah mm -hmm. and i was like oh my god to be like so self-aware and to you know what a good again. parent right oh, I we know. just fuck the whole family let's just <laughs> national the whole treasures. Family. they're exactly. all national treasures <laughs> just... they should move into the auris with with miggledy you know <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i know so Miguel D is our president, Christian? Michael D. Higgins. And what was he? Somebody and said one dog across. died. We were a bit sad. Oh, yeah, oh his dog. Yeah. Yeah. They were yeah. But I remember, I can't actually remember this. Maybe you can help me remember it. But somebody put on, um, on Twitter that he was a cross between Danny DeVito and someone else. Oh, who was it? Interesting. Huh. And it was so accurate. Uh, you know what? I, I I'll find it and I, I'll, I'll post it on 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 Twitter. You can put it I'll... in the in the link in the description for the yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. He's amazing. Do we want to wrap up? Yeah, yeah. yeah we we're getting there. Then. So remind me now. The next episode is January January fifteenth. January fifteenth. Okay. Yes, we're okay. taking a holiday break. Okay. We're on a break. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so that's it for this evening guys thanks for joining us uh, you can find us as usual on um, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at Beer Ladies um, dot something I've forgotten, I've blanked and we're also, so you can watch us on YouTube and listen to us wherever you get your podcast like, we'll be back subscribe. next in um, January we're going to take a bit of a break over Christmas so we'll be next podcast will be January 12th Happy okay. holidays. 15. Happy, Happy holidays. Christmas. Bye. work with a, a jesus and every time he joins the call he says hello this is jesus and every time we're like praise be <laughs> every time it never gets old so we are so childish oh, I love yeah <laughs>